Do you like a good mystery? Many people enjoy watching or reading a good mystery, where they piece together all of the clues in order to gain understanding and solve the mystery. Just as in a good mystery novel, in, everyday, in our everyday experiences, we are continually required to pick up on verbal and physical cues expressed by others to determine meaning. This ability to determine meaning based upon clues and our previous experience or understanding is called making an inference or drawing a conclusion. So I want you to look at this picture. What can you infer or conclude based upon what you see? Various thoughts probably come to mind. But typically, we would infer that this boy does not like the food he's been given to eat. This is based upon evidence from what we see. The facial expressions, staring at the food on this fork, the leaning on his hand. This all triggers what is called schema, or the basis by which we relate to an event, concept, or idea. It's also based upon the previous experience and knowledge that we have. You may have been in a similar situation as this boy, or you might have had a child of your own with, an, with a similar expression or stance when asked to eat something that he or she doesn't like. Based upon both what we see and what we already know, we can make the inference or draw a conclusion based upon the evidence we see that this boy doesn't like the food he has, specifically the vegetables. Let's try this with another picture. What can you infer based upon this picture? Clearly the man seems excessively emotional about something that was said or not said on the phone. His face looks agitated. He seems to be yelling at the phone. Based upon our schema of the situation, we'll pull from our previous understanding and knowledge. I have felt this way, the man is when dealing with telemarketers who are continually calling me or will not take no for an answer. So I can infer based upon the evidence and given my background knowledge and experience that this man is yelling at someone on the phone, probably an annoying salesperson. Is the inference you made similar? We each are unique and will bring with us various views, experiences, and knowledge. What if this man in the picture was in fact the telemarketer? Does that change your view of the meaning? If he was the one making the annoying call, what would cause him to have such an expression? The point is, when we make an inference, we base it off of experience from what we see, hear, and read, which interacts with our own personal knowledge and experience, which helps us come to a conclusion. Making an inference or drawing a conclusion is something that requires us to think at a higher level and be more deep about uh, our understanding. It requires the ability to identify supporting details provided by the author, which often uh, come in the form of specific word choice uh, used in the text, which helps guide, guide us to know what the author is hinting at, along with specific information such as events, facts, and examples that are provided. Thinking about the clues that have been given by the author, we activate our background knowledge or schema to help us figure out what the big picture is. Our schema is the underlying organizational pattern and structure um, of what we know. It is often composed of our own personal experience, which re we relate to the clues we've read and to our prior knowledge of what we already know about the particular subject or topic. We take this information and we then apply logical reasoning or try to see if the details in our background uh, draw us to a logical conclusion. If it does, we can be confident that we have made a sound inference based upon the evidence from the text and our own personal knowledge. However, if the inferences we are making don't make logical sense, then we need to look for more clues and more details from the text and our background um, to see if we can come up with a better or more concrete uh, conclusion. So we would go back to the text, we would look and think more deeply about what we had read. Go ahead and pause the video and read the short passage. 
So what evidence do we have from the text? First, we know that there have been a lot of wildfires so far this year or in 2015 that has surpassed previous years. Another key detail that was provided um, from the text was that the, the smoke is mostly over um, the Midwest United States and heading towards the Mid-Atlantic States. The final uh, detail that I pulled from this particular text is that the smoke particles are going to be filtering colors in the air so that, you know, reds, pinks, and oranges are going to be brighter in the, in the sky. So now I think about all of that evidence and about what I already know about smoke in the air. As I think about it, my mind recalls an experience I had with a forest fire when I was younger. I remember how the sky had a hazy brown look during this major forest fire when I was a boy. I also remember that the sunsets and sunrises during that particular fire were very, very vivid and pink and orange and red. Based upon the, uh, the facts of the text and also my own personal experience, I can infer that the air is probably going to be hazy in the Midwest and Mid-Atlantic states and that they're probably going to have some pretty extraordinary sunsets and sunrises over the next little bit when the smoke is in the air. We've talked a lot about using the information given by the author and also using our prior knowledge and experience to draw conclusions about what we're reading. Another clue an author will leave in the text is specific words or phrases that are meant to tilt our view to one direction or another. The reason that the author will do this is certain words or phrases have a type of connotation or feeling or emotion associated with them. For example, let's look at the following sentence. The student listened to a professor. We can inf what can we infer about this student? Well, there's not much other than we know that the student listened to a professor, but we don't really know much more than that. Now, if I was an author and wanted you to think that the student was a good student, I might put this type of sentence together instead. The student diligently heeded her professor. Being diligent is someone who follows the rules and does what they're told. I tend to have a positive emotional outlook on someone who is diligently doing anything. So I would probably make the inference or draw the conclusion that this student was a good student and probably did their homework and did well on tests. Now watch what happens if I as the author wanted to change and change the sentence a little to be more like this. The cunning student listened to her professor. My background with the word cunning kicks in and the image of used car salesmen, foxes, tricksters comes to mind. This leads me down the road to infer that the student is someone who's trying to trick the professor or looking for a way to get an easy A. Word choice plays a powerful role in how an author manipulates us into drawing certain inferences or conclusions. A wise reader needs to be aware of the language that the author uses. We'll cover this in greater detail in the module about author's tone and bias. I wanted to quickly review the formula we can use to draw a sound conclusion to things you read or hear. First, we look for the details and pay close attention to them, specifically looking at the words being used and what information is being presented. If all of the words are slanted negatively um, and the only information that is given to us is negative evidence or details, then we can know that the, the author is probably trying to persuade us to form a negative conclusion about the topic. Again, this ties very closely to another module, uh, Author's Tone and Bias. Next, we think about what we know and our personal experience with the particular topic being discussed. Does this match up with what we already know about the topic? Do we have personal experiences that are being confirmed or disproved by what we're, by what we're reading? We want to connect what we already know with what we are learning. So it's an essential step to kind of organize and consolidate what we're reading with what we already know. After uh, we've identified the details and connected what we know, we want to logically reason um, if our conclusions are sound. 
If it's logical, we're good. If it's not or it doesn't make sense, then we need to go back and rethink our conclusion. The process sounds complicated and time consuming, but we do this all the time in just a matter of seconds. So let's go ahead and practice one more time before you move on to your practice set. Go ahead and pause the video and take a moment to read this passage. See if you can make any inferences. What can we infer or conclude about this article? Well, based upon the evidence, we can make an inference that heliotropism uh, is the ability of a flower to turn themselves towards the sun throughout the day. This seems to match up with my background knowledge of sunflowers and, and the details in the text, and, and it feels logical to me. However, if I had come to the conclusion that, let's say, sunflowers don't grow well in hot, dry climates, logically this conclusion doesn't fit with the details in the passage. So we would know that the conclusion that I'm making or the inference that I'm drawing is erroneous and I need to rethink or go back to the article and try to um, deepen my understanding. Uh, nowhere in the passage does it talk about conditions for growing sunflowers. What the article or passage talks about is how uh, a sunflower has this ability to actually remain facing towards the sun as the sun moves across the sky. So it's about heliotropism and so that would be uh, a logical con uh, inference that I could draw from that particular passage. There are some sunflowers for you to brighten your day. All right, in conclusion, it's important to remember that the ultimate aim for making inference inferences is to successfully draw conclusions at the end of our reading of a paragraph, a passage, a chapter, whatever it is we're reading. I like to think of inferences as the connecting the dot phase of our learning. It's drawing it or putting it all together and consolidating learning um, into a big whole. So another thing that's important about inferences and drawing conclusions is most often many of the reading strategies that we use and talk about rely upon our ability to actually draw conclusions. Uh, where will you encounter inferences as a college student? Well, you all the time. There, it's everywhere. Professors will often ask you to uh, read something or read multiple texts and then come to class prepared to have a discussion about what you've read. The ability to summarize the information and then also be able to draw conclusions and connect it to other things that you've learned or talked about in the class is critical in playing an active role in that discussion. Further, oftentimes uh, when you take tests, Tests uh, require that you draw a conclusion and make inferences to answer questions. So as a college student, drawing conclusions and using inferencing is something that you do all of the time and you must be very skilled at. So drawing conclusions is an essential skill that you will need to master to be a successful college reader. So in your uh, next reading experience, take a few moments, stop what you're reading, and see if you can draw some conclusions or make some inferences about what you're reading and uh, grow your learning and understanding.